there are lots of things that you need to consider when working to create great software. We talk about quite a lot of them on this channel. But one topic that I've meant to talk about for a long time now is vital to success. It isn't the language that we choose nor the tools that we edit the code with. It isn't the elegance of the code, although that still matters. But if you intend to do this kind of thing at scale beyond a collection of a few close collaborators, it's team organization. If you are working on something that involves more than a handful of people, how you divide up the work, what skills you have on the team and how you structure teams is critical to success. So how should we organize ourselves to do a good job? How do we divide up a complex software system so that people can work on it quickly and efficiently? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. As I said in the intro, I've meant to cover this topic for some time now. I've had my own views on scaling up and structuring teams for a long time, but I was delighted when a couple of years ago, some friends of mine published a book which completely nailed this topic and gave us a vocabulary and a model to direct our thinking. The book is called Team Topologies, and I think that every leader in every large software organization ought to read it. You'll be doing yourselves a big favor if you do. When I read this book, it wasn't really a revelation, but rather it fits so well with how I thought about this part of the problem and so clearly explained the patterns and anti-patterns that I was familiar with that I found myself continuously nodding and smiling throughout as I recognized old friends and enemies that I'd seen in many teams. My approach though was less fully formed. I had guidelines and rules of thumb, but what Matt and Manuel, the authors, have done is to create a model that explains these ideas more clearly and structures them into tools that we can all use. So my aim for this episode is to try and explain my views on team structure and explore the team topologies model to enhance my explanations. Let's start with something obvious. That isn't always quite so obvious, perhaps. Team size, which is hugely important. This is very well established and has been known for a very long time. Small teams are vital to doing a good job. Fred Brooks said it in the 1970s, Kent Beck said it again in the 1990s, and lots of people have repeated it in different forms ever since. But still, not every organization listens, I'm afraid. My favourite take on this is a piece of research that I came across some time ago in the form of a metadata study of the impact of team size on software development. This study looked at over 4,000 projects and divided them into two groups, teams of 20 people or more and teams of five people or fewer. Then they measured how long it took each group to generate 100,000 lines of code. We all know that measuring lines of code is a terrible metric, but it tells you something about the amount of work being done. On average, for all of the teams, it took nine months to generate 100,000 lines of code. On average, the teams of 20 people beat the teams of five to 100,000 lines, as you may expect. But they only beat them by a week over that period of nine months. So the first finding is that a team of five is nearly four times as productive as a team of 20. The study then looked at the quality of the code measured by the amount of defects. On average, a team of 20 people produced five times as many defects as a team of five. So small teams are more productive and produce work of higher quality. Matt and Manuel, the authors of the Team Topologies book, have an explanation for this. It's about cognitive load, the amount of stuff that we need to think about to do our work. As team size goes up, cognitive load goes up along with it. The small team thing has been known for a very long time in a wide variety of contexts. This isn't about software, this is about humans. There's a thing called the Dunbar number, which places a limit on the number of stable social relationships that we can maintain. 
It's around 150. This is visible in all sorts of places, how military forces tend to organise themselves, and the fact that there's a huge jump in complexity in growing a company beyond this number of people. There are other numbers that seem relevant to this too. Five people is about the limit for a close personal relationship. 15 people is the limit for how many people can share deep trust about, and around 50 people for mutual trust. So if we want teams to be efficient and effective, they need to be small and we need to take these numbers seriously. Matt and Manuel says that a team should be five to nine people. I usually say four to eight, maybe because I like pairing more than them. If a team gets bigger than this, you should be looking for how to split it into two teams. The team is the primary unit of work, not the individual. The team own responsibility and works as a unit to achieve shared agreed goals. This gets us to the next vital aspect of this type of organisational strategy. Something that we often don't consider, the human structures that we build in organisations are information systems too. How we structure our teams and organise our work is deeply related to how we structure the code and systems that we build. This is commonly described in terms of Conway's law, which says any organisation that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organisation's communication structure. But I think it goes even deeper than that. In information terms, this is all down to coupling really, I think. The communication structure in an organisation implicitly defines how much or how little teams are coupled to one another. If Team A needs to communicate with Team B and Team C to get work done, that's going to have a very different outcome to Team A being able to make progress alone in parallel with the others. To enable that less constrained approach, we need to set the boundaries and responsibilities for the teams up in a way that prefers teams that are loosely coupled with respect to other teams. We organise in ways that allow teams more autonomy. One route to this is to divide the work in ways that minimise dependencies between the teams. This is a kind of team-first approach to design. Another aspect of this is to organise the boundaries between teams so that they are loosely coupled enough that teams can make progress independently, even when they're working on things that span teams. One strategy for this that I have long recommended is dividing teams into what I have called functional teams as the primary focus. Aligning teams with a bounded context in a problem domain is often a good starting point for this since these boundaries usually mean that the problem is naturally more decoupled at these points. Manuel and Matt have a much better name and a richer model for this though. They call them stream-aligned teams. A stream-aligned team is focused on delivering on business goals. Those are my words. Matt and Manuel say a stream is a continuous flow of work aligned to a business domain or organisational capability. They go on to say, a stream-aligned team is aligned with a sim single valuable stream of work. This is a great way to think about this. My bounded context approach is a good starting point and commonly a good strategy to use to identify decoupled streams of work. But it's rather a tactic than a goal. The goal in terms of team structure is to identify decoupled stream-aligned teams. The stream-aligned teams are the focus, the tip of the spear, if you'll forgive the rather violent analogy. Matt and Manuel say that in high-functioning organisations, you'd expect that the ratio between non-stream-aligned teams and stream-aligned teams to be probably 1 in 6 or 1 in 10. So most teams are focused on the stuff that really matters to the organisation. Other types of teams are all focused on reducing the cognitive load in stream-aligned teams. Taking responsibility for some other parts of the problem so that the stream-aligned teams can re be really productive. I think all of my clients would characterise themselves as taking an agile approach. I often don't agree that they are. Uh, but one of the anti-patterns that represents my area of disagreement that I see all the time and that Manuel and Matt point out in their book is the lack of team autonomy. 
The State of DevOps report has long pointed out that one of the strongest predictors of success for a team is its ability to make decisions and progress without needing to coordinate or ask permission from people outside the team. Matt and Manuel provide the list of capabilities that they expect to be represented within a six to nine person stream aligned team. That's a lot of stuff for a few people to be responsible for. But that is what it takes to achieve autonomy in teams. And as I've just said, autonomy in teams predicts that they will build better software faster. Quoting Matt and Manuel once again, a stream aligned team has minimal, ideally zero, handoffs of work to other teams. So this doesn't only mean that you aim to limit work to reduce handoffs like we finished the back end services, so now you can build the front end UI. It also means that we don't hand off responsibility to architecture upstream or testing and release downstream. All of these things are part of the responsibility of a stream aligned team. There are three other types of team in Manuel and Matt's model. Enabling teams, complicated subsystem teams and platform teams. The goal of all three is to support the stream aligned teams. I've seen and worked with all of these team types many times, even before I'd read Matt and Manuel's book. So I rec recognize the patterns immediately. To quote the book again, an enabling team's job is to help stream aligned teams acquiring missing capabilities. One of the common ways of doing that that I've used often is for enabling teams to lend expertise to stream aligned teams. For example, we've already said that design and architecture and UX are stream aligned team responsibilities, but it's not reasonable to expect every team to have deep expertise in these areas. So the goal in a well designed organization is to aim to grow the capability where it matters in stream aligned teams. In the past, the way that I've described this is to aim for every team to have the skills that it needs to make progress most of the time but also to have the knowledge it needs to know when something is outside of their experience and at what point to call for help. In this case, from an enabling team. The enabling team lends the stream aligned team an expert for a while. And the expert's job is not only to help solve the problem, but also to help teach the team a little more about their area of expertise in the context of the problem that they're solving together. Matt and Manuel says the primary goal of an enabling team is to help stream aligned teams to deliver working software in a sustainable, responsible way. Quite like that description. Enabling teams can provide a vital role in helping organizations make the transition to more effective development practices. Given the nature of my work over the past few years, helping big organizations to make the transition to the stronger engineering focus of continuous delivery, I've spent a lot of time helping teams that do what I call continuous delivery as a service. These are enabling teams. They serve two roles and both are common for these types of team, I think. They provide tools and infrastructure that make it easy for people to do the right kinds of things and they evangelize and offer help to other teams in the form of education and expertise. Nearly all of the big organizations that I'm aware of that had made the transition to continuous delivery have one or more very strong enabling teams focused on the skills and techniques of continuous delivery. These people are the ones that start off building the pipelines and optimizing build systems. These teams can have an enormous impact on moving the dial in an organization. There's a great case study for such a team in the Team Topologies book. In their first eight weeks, this enabling team saw a 72% decrease in deployment lead time, a 700% increase in deployment pipeline runs per day, and they optimized their pipeline to achieve a 98% reduction in the time for the pipeline to complete, going from 10 hours to 15 minutes. These kinds of improvements can happen surprisingly quickly when you focus in on the right things. Complicated subsystem teams are really what they sound like. Their focus is to reduce the cognitive load of stream aligned teams by taking responsibility for technically specialized complex parts of the problem. 
Video codecs, trade matching or interfacing with complex hardware for example. A complex subsystem team is characterised by needing people with deep expertise in a relatively narrow field. Their job is to provide code that can be used to deliver the complex value but doesn't require such deep expertise to use it. So this is more than only the idea of component ownership. This is explicitly for complex components, with a very strong focus on hiding that complexity from the stream-aligned teams. The best example that I can think of from my own experience is the LMAX Disruptor. I was working on a team that built a very high performance financial exchange. As part of that, we came up with a fairly innovative approach to organising our code into asynchronous services. But a lot of the nitty gritty implementation detail of how this worked was hidden from the stream aligned teams. The disruptor that allowed us to exchange information between threads at close to the performance limits of the processor was one component of that which needed very specific detailed skills in lock-free concurrent programming. Only a few of us worked on that code, but everyone relied on it. If you're interested in that stuff, we open source the disruptor and there's a link in the description below. The last team type is, I think, very commonly misunderstood, the platform team. The platform team is a very common idea, but I think that Matt and Manuel mean something more specific at least compared to what I see commonly referred to as platform teams. Here's how they describe it. The purpose of a platform team is to enable stream-aligned teams to deliver work with substantial autonomy. Think about that for a moment. If you can't begin work on a feature until the platform team has delivered some change, you aren't working autonomously. I like this quote from the book. Crucially, the evolution of the platform product is not simply driven by feature requests from development teams. Instead, it is curated and carefully shaped to meet their needs in the longer term. The aim overall is for the teams to be able to make progress independently of others. Of course, there are exceptions to this. Times when collaboration between teams is necessary and important. And there are chapters in the Team Topologies book that describe how to model and manage the communications between teams as well, but I'm not going to cover that here. I'm also not going to spend too much more time on platform teams here, in part because I'm thinking of recording an episode dedicated to the design of effective platforms and the appropriate focus for platform teams at some point in the future. Do let me know in the description below if this is something that you'd like to see. I don't usually do detailed book rev reviews on this channel, but every now and again something really important comes along. I think that Team Topologies is one of those books. It adds something significant, important to our discipline. It defines an approach to using organisational structure as a tool to achieve better results in software. I really strongly recommend this book to every leader in every development organisation with more than 10 people, and probably even to people in organisations with fewer people than that. Thank you very much for watching.